Would you uh, bow with me, please? Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the blessings that has given us. We know, Father, that we are among the most blessed of all peoples because we have the word to guide us. We pray, Father, that we may bend our own stubborn will to the, thy will, and we're grateful that the disclosure is made in thy word as to what thy will is for us during this lifetime, that we may gain the life to come. Go with us now as we engage in this study and bless it and all times of personal study. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As I said uh, last week, you know, the study of the prophets is something that each one of us ought to engage in, and it's a very uh, useful study because it, it tells us exactly how God deals with sin. And the inevitability of his dealing with sin, regardless of how, how long it takes, he will deal with it on a national basis and a uh, societal basis. It will happen. Now we said the uh, probably the oldest book of the Old Testament prophets. I mean, there's some doubt about it, but uh, Obadiah. And it's interesting because you know Obadiah was not dealing with you know, God's chosen people, the Jews. He was dealing with what we would call a heathen nation or a, if you want to call it a Gentile nation. But it was not one of the Jews. The first one that he dealt with through the prophets, if the uh, dating process is correct, he's dealing with uh, non-Jews, Gentiles. So that says that God is just as concerned about the obedience of the Gentiles or the heathens as he is the Jews. Now the uh, seed of promise was not coming through uh, these uh, foreign nations, if you want to call them that. But still, they had an obligation to God to be obedient to his will. And he was not indifferent to that. And we, we see that from uh, the book of Obadiah. Obadiah is dealing with the uh, Edomites. You recall that uh, Edomites uh, were the uh, offspring, if you will, of Esau, Jacob's brother. And there's always animosity between Jacob and Esau, and, and it's <laughs> for the most part because of Esau's own uh, cavalier attitude about his. Uh, uh, blessings as being the firstborn, he just treated it very lightly, and it came back to bite him. And Jacob was uh, favored because, in no small part, because of Esau's own actions. But that uh, started the uh, process of animosity between them, and uh, you know the nation, the Edomites came from Esau. And you may also recall that we see this animosity when the children of Israel were leaving Egypt and going to the Promised Land. They requested permission of the Edomites to travel through their land, and the Edomites wouldn't give it to them. And Moses said, well, you know, we're not going to take anything. We're not going to take the water. We just want passage. Nope would do it. So they had, they had to take another route. So uh, that was the, uh, uh, I guess, the uh, manifestation of the animosity. But there was more to it than that. Apparently there was, back in this time that it was written, there was some sort of uh, invasion of Jerusalem. And the Edomites did not show any kindness towards their uh, brothers in the flesh. They, they weren't Jews, but brothers in the flesh. They didn't show any kindness towards them at all. 
So, uh, see, left my Bible. I have to use my phone. <laughs> so I think we started at uh, verse eight of uh, Obadiah, first chapter, of course. Uh, and we already read about some of the reasons uh, that uh, Edom was condemned because of the pride that they had and we uh, mentioned the fact that uh, where the Edomite kingdom was originally anyway was if you were to look at uh, the Dead Sea and kind of draw a line straight down to the bottom of it. They lived on the, the right side in that very um, uh, hilly and, and uh, uh, you know, I would say it was kind of bleak countryside, but it was very good countryside for uh, defense from uh, those nations or people that might try to assault them. Also, they had doors there, you know, metallurgy, what have you that uh, made them a very uh, rich nation and also they were close to the trade routes and they could exact uh, fees for passing through their land. They could also, for small caravans, could also attack them and take everything. So they were a very rich people. It made them prideful. That's, it, it's always seemed to be the case that uh, countries that are economically advanced or powerfully, power, powerful militarily, there's a certain pride attached to that. And I wouldn't say that Americans are um, not also guilty of that particular uh, pride. And that's, you know, I, I've never really understood why it is that Americans can't speak another language. Of course, more and more we're, we're speaking Spanish. That's not because Native Americans are learning, it's because of the uh, uh, illegal immigration. But for the most part, we don't, uh, you know, we're Americans. We don't have to learn other languages. But Europeans do, you know, from, by and large, they'll know English. And uh, other European countries are, well, know multiple languages, but we don't. So that's, well, that's a, a result of pride or not. Uh, I suppose there's some, maybe some uh, debate about that, but nevertheless, that is the case. So, uh, Edom was very prideful, and, and uh, during this, uh, if it's a um, assault on Jerusalem, they didn't. Uh, they were very. Um, neglectful of their brotherly duties there. And I'll read it very quickly, but it, it says, and thus says the Lord concerning Edom, and it's coming from the Lord. Uh, we've heard a report from the Lord. Again, that gives it authority. And the messenger has been sent among the nations, so there are other nations that have been made aware of this. I don't know who the messenger was. And rise, arise and let us rise up against her for battle. So. Uh, Edom is going to be assaulted. Behold, I'll make you small among the nations. You will be greatly despised. So whatever the Edom thought about themselves, uh, that was not going to uh, persist. And they're going to be greatly despised. It's not that necessar necessarily that people hated Edom, but if they saw a weakness there and wanted to attack them, uh, you know, we always seemed to, when we at war with another country, seemed to denigrate those people. We did it with the Japanese, we did it with the Germans, and uh, it's just, I guess, the very nature of the thing. It said, the pride, in verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. You, will, you who dwell in the cliffs of the rock, whose habitation is high, you say in your heart, very prideful, who will bring you down to the ground? <clears throat> and as I said, this... Uh, Geography of that area was very a very defensible area, very difficult to assault that, that their positions. 
Though you ascend as high as the eagle, and though you set your nest among the stars, it didn't matter. They were still going to be brought down. You know, of course, this is a uh, hypothetical. If you had your dwelling among the stars, you're still going to be brought down. And if these had come to you as robbers by night, how you, uh, you will be cut off. And would they not have stolen till they had enough? If grape gatherers had come to you, would they not have left some gleanings? You know, robbers usually just take what they uh, can grab quickly and, and be gone. And if you uh, grape gatherers had come, you know, they, they're always going to leave something. But this is not going to be the case with Edom. It's going to be totally destroyed. Everything is going to be taken. Any sort of uh, produce and anything like that is nothing's going to be left. Oh, how Esau shall be searched out, how his hidden treasure shall be sought after. No use hiding it in the mattress. <laughs> it's still going to be found. You may have some secret places. It's still going to be found. And all, that's all to say that uh, Edom, you're going to be totally destroyed. All the men in your confederacy shall force you to the border, and the men of peace with you shall deceive you and prevail against you. Those who eat your bread shall lay a trap for you. No one is aware of it. And I said uh, last week, uh, of course, uh, Edom had formed a, uh, an alliance with uh, some of the nations around about it. But it always seemed to be the case that you, know, you may have uh, allies by treaty, but when it comes to the prospect of war, that ally is going to make a an assessment at that time as to whether or not they're going to go, go to war on your behalf if you're the uh, one that's being uh, calling for the assistance from your allies. They're going to make that determination. I don't care what the, the alliance says. They're going to make that determination, and they just may not honor it. And in this case, uh, those in the alliance with Edom were not going to honor that. And a lot of these countries or kingdoms around about Edom, depending on Edom for uh, their commerce, and so that's kind of the bread that they're eating, but they're going to lay a trap for it. You think they're going to come to your aid, but they're not. And you're not even aware of it. You're not aware of the condition that you're in. He says in verse 8, Will I not in that day, that day, says the Lord, even destroy the wise men uh, from Edom and understanding from the mountains of Esau? Now, Edomites were known for their wisdom. But this calamity is going to come upon Edom, and the wise men are not going to be able to figure it out. They're not going to be able to come up with any sort of uh, contingency plan or... There's no plan B. There's nothing. They're just not going to be able to figure it out, no matter how wise they are. Then your mighty man, men, O Teman, shall be dismayed. And they were known for having mighty men. But they, they're going to be confused. They're not going to know what to do. That uh, gives the extent of their destruction that awaits them. To the end that everyone from the mountains of Esau may be cut off by slaughter. Now, this uh, mountains of Esau were again, again a very formidable, formidable uh, geography to assault. But they're still going to be cut off, and they're going to be slaughtered. Now, why is this? Well, we already mentioned up here for their pride. That's one thing. Uh, in verse 3, the pride of your heart has deceived you. Pride does that. That's one reason. And then in verse 10, it says, for violence against your brother Jacob. Shame shall cover you. Cover you. Shame because they're going to be defeated. Uh, they think they're something when they're really not. So as, as a result of that, they're going to in, in, uh, experience shame. And you shall be cut off forever. There's not going to be 
any half measures with Edom. They're going to be destroyed completely. In the day that you stood on the other side, now what's the other side? Well, it's not the side of the Lord. It's, a side, it's not the side of uh, the Jews of Jerusalem. That's not the side that he's talking about. It's the other side, those that are attacking Jerusalem. In the day that strangers carried captive his forces, talking about Jerusalem, and foreigners entered his gates and cast lots for Jerusalem. As a foreign invader, I don't know which particular invasion this is, but they're foreign invaders. And Edom, and if you were to go back in time, the Edomites were brothers in the flesh to uh, the Jews. So they, had, they should have had a little compassion on them, but they didn't. Even you were as one of them. Now, you may not have, uh, talking about Edomites, you may not have actually been the ones assaulting Jerusalem, but you condoned it. You promoted it. You were pleased with it. And that's a lesson for us today that, you know, we should be very reticent about um, signing on to any sort of uh, uh, protest or <laughs> riot or anything else uh, or any cause for which we cannot, we do not have authority from the scriptures. And be very careful about engaging in that and, and uh, allowing yourself to be pulled into that. It says here in verse uh, 12, but you should not have gazed uh, on the day of your brother and the day of his captivity when they were assaulted in Jerusalem and they were captured. This gazing on it is gazing on it with uh, approval. And they were rejoicing in it. Nor should you have rejoiced over the children of Judah in the day of their destruction. There's consequences to actions, whatever the action may be, whether it's merely uh, mental acquiescence or active participation. You shouldn't uh, delight in the uh, misfortune of others. Verse 13, you should not have entered the gate of my people in the day of their calamity. So not only were they standing from afar looking at it, they apparently have entered the gates of Jerusalem in that day of calamity, and they gazed on the affliction of the Jews, and they did it with approval. They said, indeed, you should not have gazed on their affliction in the day of their calamity. Not only do they do that, he said, nor laid hands on their substance in the day of their calamity. So not only did they give approval to it, they uh, saw an opportunity for taking uh, some nice things from Jerusalem. Now, does that ever happen today? Let's say there's a... Uh, for example, say there's a riot. Are there those that approve of the riot? Not only approve of it, but take advantage of the calamity and lay their hands on some of the substance. That is just flat out wrong. I don't care how you may justify it. That is just flat out wrong. And the, uh, the uh, Edomites uh, were so informed that it, it was wrong. Not only did they do that, but, uh, you know, when the Jews were fleeing, he said, you should not have stood at the crossroads. Apparently there's some ways that they were fleeing. Some roads had uh, some choke points there, and the Edomites were there at those crossroads. And the reason that they were there is to cut off those Jews who were escaping from the uh, assault on Jerusalem. Not only did they cut them off, 
but it says, nor should you have delivered up those among them who remained in the day of dis distress. Well, delivered them up to whom? They apparently captured them, and they delivered them up to someone. It may be in the, uh, those that are, were assaulting Jerusalem. But, you know, it's, it's an economic thing, so they, they may have just uh, sold these Jews into slavery. And again, if you go back far enough, they're bro brothers in the flesh. So they're selling their brothers in the flesh uh, into slavery or delivering them up to the, uh, those that are assaulting Jerusalem. It says in 15, For the day of the Lord uh, upon all the nations is near. And, and this phrase, the day of the Lord, this may be the first time it's ever been used uh, in the Bible, if this is the oldest book. But the day of the Lord always indicates, well, one of two things. Uh, most of the time, in, in case there's going to be some uh, disaster, some period of judgment that's going to be uh, visited upon whoever it is that they're addressing. And it could be a good thing, too. Uh, but the most part, is there's going to be some severe judgment on somebody, whoever is, is the subject of who's being discussed here. For the day of the Lord upon all the nations is near. As you have done, it shall be done to you. A great lesson that we should all learn. Uh, what, you know, we said different ways. What goes around comes around. Uh, what you do unto others is going to be done to you eventually. And that's what uh, Obadiah is telling the Edomites. The things that you have done to uh, Jerusalem, your Jews, your brothers in the flesh, the same thing is going to be done to you, except it's going to be much worse. It's going to be much worse. Your reprisal shall return upon your own head. Now, I can see where the uh, wise men would find this confusion given uh, at the time that this was, uh, message was delivered to them, their positions of power, they could not have conceived that, you know, they were going to suffer anything. It says, For as you drank on my holy mountain, so shall all the nations drink continually. Yes, they shall drink and swallow, and they shall be as though they had never been. Now, they were drinking the good things on the uh, holy mountain, which is Jerusalem. They were partaking of that. And the drink of bitterness is going to fall. It's going to fall on all these nations. And they, they're going to drink it. Not only are they going to drink it, but they, they're going to swallow it. This uh, judgment of bitterness is going, it's going to be like a drink, and they're going to drink it. And they shall be as though they have never been. Now you think about all the nations that were around Jerusalem at the time. They don't exist anymore. And we'll see the same thing happen with the Edomites. And I was reading in, in my Bible the introduction to it, and it, it said that uh, uh, Obadiah is nothing but uh, a prediction of the destruction of of uh, Edom, there is absolutely no hope for the Edomites, but that's not exactly true. In verse 17, it says, "But on Mount Zion there shall be deliverance." Well, deliverance for whom? Well, Mount Zion is uh, have, really have to be talking about a spiritual Mount Zion. Uh, that's a, a deliverance through obedience to the God of the Israelites. You know, that's where his presence was the, uh, in uh, Jerusalem. And there shall be holiness. That's where it was. So if the Edomites, the Edomite nation was gone, it's going to be gone. But if the Edomites want to be delivered, they're going to have to look not to Mount Seir, which is in uh, uh, 
the kingdom of Edom. Not, you can't look there. It's going to have to be Mount Zion, a spiritual Mount Zion. That's where salvation is going to be. So if you want deliverance, you're going to have to look there. And if you can't accept that, where well, are you going to be destroyed? You're going to be absolutely destroyed. It says, On Mount Zion there <coughs> shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness. The house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. You know, even though Jacob or the uh, Jews um, had to suffer invasion themselves, that's their possession. They're going to possess it. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, and the house of Joseph a flame. Now, you can think of this, Jacob as the uh, southern kingdom and Joseph as the northern kingdom. They're going to be united in a spiritual uh, Mount Zion. And not a physical one, but a spiritual Mount Zion. But the house of Esau shall be stubble, and they shall kindle them and devour them, and no survivor shall remain of the house of Esau, for the Lord has spoken. Now, if you ever, uh, those of you that uh, had anything to do with farming, you, you know what stubble is when you remove the crops. You know, you got short uh, stalks still there. And that's uh, what he's saying. It's all going to be, all that's going to be left of the house of uh, Jacob. There's no, not going to be anything of value there. It's just going to be like stubble. And uh, in verse 19, the south shall possess the mountains of Esau, uh, south of uh, uh, Jacob, kingdom of you know, the Jews. They're going to possess the mountains of Esau. And the lowlands shall possess Philistia, and they shall possess the fields of Ephraim and the fields of Samaria, and Benjamin shall possess Gilead. There's no mention of Edomites here. Edomites are not going to possess anything. And the captives of this host of the children of Israel shall possess the land of the Canaanites as far as Zarephath, the captives of Jerusalem who are in Shepharad shall possess the cities of the south. In verse 21, the saviors, saviors shall come to Mount Zion to judge the mountain of Esau, and the kingdom shall be of the Lord's. So salvation was going to come through uh, the spiritual Mount Zion, the spiritual Jerusalem. It's going to be through the church. Uh, saviors. There's more than one Savior. How many Saviors do we have? Well, we have one Savior, we call one Savior Jesus Christ. But you can think of those who delivered the, uh, the gospel message also as saviors because they disclosed exactly how it is that one can come to a knowledge of the truth and be saved thereby. So, what happened to Edom? What did happen to Edom? Of course, we know that they came from um, Esau, and they were eventually uh, pushed out of that area, kind of southeast of the, the bottom of the Dead Sea by the Nabataeans, which were Arabs. They pushed them out, and they moved over a little bit west to the south of Judah, and that's about oh, around 400 uh, B.C., somewhere around in there. I'll have to check my calendar in to see for sure. <laughs> but uh, then Judas Maccabeus uh, conquered them and he killed about 20,000 of them. So he conquered them but they still were, I guess, semi-free at the time. And John Hyrcanus, uh in, in the 130s or somewhere in there, actually conquered them and, and uh, 
required, if they want to live anyway, required that they be circumcised and accept uh, Judaism. So they became technically proselytes. But they kind of lost their identity as the nation of Edom, or the kingdom of Edom. They really uh, started to be called the uh, Ijumeans. You know, you know, a famous Ijumean was Herod. He was, I guess, technically from the nation of the uh, kingdom of Edom. They call it Ijumea at the time. But anyway, uh, that's where he came from. And about, uh, you know, after the destruction of Jerusalem, 80, 70, and maybe a few years after that, the uh, Edomites just disappeared from history. You no longer hear anything about them. So they got absorbed by someone. There may be somebody running around today that has blood of Esau in them, but they're not known by that. And it's not me. <laughs> the best you could say about me is I'm Samaritan. But <laughs> well, the worst, I'm not sure what it is. But anyway, but to think about it now, as I said, God is concerned about sin wherever it is by whoever commits it. He's not indifferent to it, and he will deal with it. I've said many times that given the moral depravity of this country, how long will he suffer us uh, to continue as a nation? And I can say that about a lot of nations in the world today. But you think about it, uh, Edom. You know, when the uh, East scholars think that uh, Obadiah was written about 800 B.C., and the Edomites disappeared from history, about 100 or 80, 100, somewhere in that first century. So that's eight or 900 years that uh, Edomites continued. So how long will God suffer? Well, apparently a long time. Sometimes he uh, doesn't wait long at all. When, when it comes to nations, he's very long-suffering. So how long will he suffer with the moral depravity of the United States? I do not know. It may not be long in coming, or it may be multiple lifetimes in the future. I just don't know. But I do know from Obadiah that he's not indifferent to it. God is not indifferent to it. He will deal with it in his own good time, not according to time that I think that it should be done, or even in a way that I think it should be done. So. Anybody have any comments? You know, this is really a class, so anybody wants to? Yes, sir. I uh, found it interesting where the, uh, I think in verse 12 and also in verse 13, where it says, You should not have gazed on their affliction. And one of the notes I had on the definition of maybe a rephrasing of gaze is gloating over. That's what they were doing. That's exactly what they were doing. They were not just saying, hey, look at there. <laughs> no, they were looking on it with approval yeah. and saying, I'm glad somebody's doing it to them, and I would have liked to have done it myself, but I'm glad somebody's doing it. Yeah, it's not merely just uh, you know looking at it. It's, it's uh, well, gloating. You're gloating over the, over the misfortune of the uh, Israelites. So you know, that's a good, good lesson for us, you know. Even enemies that suffer, we should have a modicum of compassion towards even those. It may be that their uh, uh, misfortune may work out to the good of the rest of us, but you, you know, you don't have to gloat over it. You could have. Uh, pray that they would have so conducted themselves that you know it was not necessary that they be uh, destroyed at all. And that's probably the thing here about the Edomites. If they had so conducted themselves uh, in a different manner, it may be that they were never destroyed. 
So if we don't want to be destroyed ourselves as a nation, they still act like the uh, Edomites, or a lot of the uh, heathen nations around about, or even those of the Jews. Jim? Yes, sir. Uh, You better get get settled. It's a uh, self-deception, I think, on people, even though they hear these things, uh, they think that, well, it's not going to happen to us. I mean, we're Edomites. We're Americans. It's not going to happen to us. Maybe somebody over there in, in a third world country, but not us. You know, we're still looking for our stimulus check. <laughs> It just simply can't happen to us. But, uh, you know, Ezekiel said, you know, you, know, you, you better get settled in. You're going to be here a while. I guess I uh, take some encouragement from the fact that he is so long-suffering. You know, it, it, you have to admit that we're in a, morally we're in a terrible shape today. Uh, you know, who would ever thought that we'd be killing our own children just out of a matter of our own convenience? Who ever thought that? <clears throat> I mean, back when we were growing up in the 50s, we wouldn't have thought a lot of the things. We thought it was impossible for a lot of things uh, that are going on today could ever happen. We just couldn't conceive of it. You and I were growing up, the only thing we had to worry about is trans fats. <laughs> but now, now it's trans everything else. So. I remember, uh, and Stephen may remember this, that when Avery was still in over in Howdy Elementary, they had a day where uh, the boys were going to come to school dressed as girls, and 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 maybe the you may correct me, Stephen. The guys were the girls were going to dress as boys, something like that. So, some such thing. Like, of course, Avery said, "That's crazy." <laughs> and uh, the teacher said, "Oh no, uh, you know that's not crazy. That's 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 fine." And of course, next year they took her out and started homeschooling her. So, but. Yeah. 
Well, for the most part, the people that we deal with, uh, these sorts of things are just as foreign to uh, righteous living as anything it ever could be. And I hope you know, we we are an island in a sea of immorality. We are that, but we have to stay afloat. We have to stay afloat because we are the only hope that that uh, this country has. So. Yeah. wasn't permitted to read it or he just couldn't read well it could be could be yeah but you don't know I would have said that years ago if he was one or the other I don't know that I can be that sure of that yeah well we can just you know keep praying to God for uh, deliverance from the evil that presently surrounds us and man we may have to accept what that deliverance means you know how it's actually done but uh, at least we can trust God to do it in the, the best way possible but he here's, is here's the way I'm going to do it and man I think it's so that one little instant one instant hand strikes out that's the way it's yeah Yeah, that's right. That's right. Any other comments? Well, you are dismissed next week. We'll do Joel.